hurricanes with such intensity they leave thousands homeless. Tornadoes so destructive they flatten everything in their path. And flooding so powerful it swallows up entire towns. They are all examples of Mother Nature's power, fortified by a rapidly changing climate. It's not hard to understand why the United Nations has called climate change the defining issue of our time when you consider the stats. The average global temperature has risen almost a degree since 1880, and our oceans have risen by a whopping 19 centimeters. And CO2 levels in the atmosphere, well, those have increased exponentially too, especially since the Industrial Revolution, and are currently at the highest level in 650,000 years. And what we're doing now is putting carbon out of the ground, those millions of years worth of carbon, putting that into the atmosphere over a few hundred years. So we're doing that much, much faster than geology has ever done. With a greater awareness of climate change and the role that CO2 plays, there has been a strong emphasis on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But reducing emissions is not the only answer to the climate problem. On the day we stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere, we have not solved the climate problem. People will still be dying of heat waves, the oceans will still be rising, it'll still be hot. And if you want to reduce that risk, you're going to have to find ways to take CO2 slowly out of the atmosphere. We hear a lot about reducing emissions through carbon taxes and government-imposed fines. But what we don't often hear about are tools used to reduce emissions. Tools like carbon capture and storage, or better known as CCS. So that's not understood by many people. That Capturing and recapturing carbon is not something that's nice to have, something you can delay until your grandchildren are grown up. It's something we, in our generation, have to tackle now. Carbon capture technologies allow an emitter, like a factory, power plant, or oil and gas operation, to capture CO2. The CO2 is separated and extracted. It can be compressed into a pressurized liquid, which is then injected into a borehole deep underground, where it is stored naturally, basically taking the CO2 that would otherwise be trapped in the atmosphere and putting it back into the earth. You can kind of think of that um, as a bucket of sand that you would have at a beach, um, that the rock looks a little bit like that. And then instead of, um, instead of say, in the water that you have at, at a beach, there's just carbon dioxide inside those little tiny there are three main types of carbon capture and storage that are in use today. The first is called post-combustion, where the CO2 is separated from the flue gas. Those are the gases you see coming out of a smokestack. This is done by bubbling the gas through an absorber column packed with liquid solvents like ammonia. Once the chemicals in the column become saturated, superheated steam is passed through it. This releases and separates the trapped CO2, which can then be stored. The second type is called oxyfuel. This method means fuel, like coal, is burnt in a pure oxygen environment. Virtually all of the waste gas that's produced will be composed of just CO2 and water vapor, meaning the CO2 can be piped directly to storage. The third is called pre-combustion. Solid, liquid, or gaseous fuel is first converted into a mixture of hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Then, the hydrogen can be pumped out and used to fuel electricity production and even hydrogen cell cars. The CO2 that remains can then be stored. Carbon capture isn't actually new. It's been around since the 1970s, and since that time, facilities have been coming online worldwide, and the technology has proven to be both safe and useful. There are now some 18 projects up and running across the globe, and that number is growing with a further five in development and 20 more being planned. We have a total capacity of around 40 million tons per annum. So that's the current capacity that we have today. And that equals to roughly taking away, taking off more than 8 million cars from the road. What about cost? Critics say that it's too expensive to implement carbon capture on a mass scale. It's a very expensive uh, option. Uh, it's also one which is technically very complex. Uh, and I think that it's not really been the great hope that uh, the people were, were, were looking at it uh, to be 20 years ago. But it is getting cheaper and easier. Anne Halliday works with Shell on the Quest carbon capture project in Canada's oil sands and says that it is more accessible all the time. We often hear that carbon capture is very expensive. Um, and 10 years ago, when we, when we kicked off this, this project and started building it, um, we anticipated that the costs were going to be around $120 a ton, sort of over the, over the life of this, of this facility. 
Um, what is super, super exciting is that our costs are, are coming down quite a bit. Even though the costs are coming down, environmental groups like Greenpeace remain skeptical and advocate a more holistic approach. Carbon capture and storage is always going to be a uh, a technological approach to uh, trying to, to, to fix a problem, if you like. And I think we need increasingly to be avoiding the problem by getting ourselves out of fossil fuel. Experts also agree that just capturing and storing the emissions from big business through conventional carbon capture isn't enough either. In the atmosphere, we've increased the total stock, the total amount of carbon dioxide. So it's rather like having a carbon warehouse, which was empty, and we've filled it up with carbon dioxide the warehouse is now full, it's spilling out the sides. That's where companies like Carbon Engineering come in. Carbon Engineering was founded by David Keith, a Harvard professor who wanted to actually remove CO2 directly from the air around us. I thought it was a really important tool to have in the climate toolbox. Think of it like a giant vacuum cleaner powered by huge industrial fans that suck CO2 right out of the air. Today, the company is one of only a handful capturing carbon this way. The Canadian-based companies secured backing from several energy and oil companies, as well as Bill Gates. And they aren't stopping at merely capturing that CO2. They want to turn it back into fuel to power vehicles. They've already proven it's doable, and within five years, they hope to be turning CO2 into fuel on a large scale. A full-scale plant for us does the work of about 40 million trees in removing carbon dioxide. Uh, and then we can make many thousands of barrels of fuel per day with that. So although carbon capture and storage, along with direct air capture technologies, are important parts of the toolbox to fight climate change, it's only a piece of the puzzle that needs to be a part of the overall solution. So the big lesson here is that if humanity wants to really cut emissions, we need strong policies that put a strong penalty on using the atmosphere as a waste dump for carbon.